Hello, good morning and welcome everybody. I'm Noah schultz Bayard, the South Australian Director at the Australia Institute. And I'm filling in today for the usual host of our webinar series, the Institute's Deputy Director, Ebony Bennett. I can see that there's a, a whole stream of you coming through the digital doors, so to speak. Thank you for being with us today. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I'm currently on the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and I know that some of our guests are appearing today from the land of the Ngunnawal people in Canberra. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present. Well, like I say, thank you so much for joining us today for this, the, the next installment in our webinar series for 2021. We are hosting these webinars each week, but the times and the days of the week that we host them on do vary. Uh, you can make sure that you don't miss out on any of these fabulous webinars by signing up for uh, notifications on our website, which is australiainstitute.org.au. You can also find recordings of all of our previous webinars on the site. Now, just a few Zoom tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover your mouse pointer over the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panelists and you can also upvote questions uh, from other people. You can also make comments in the chat, which is also down the bottom. Speaking of the chat, we ask that you please keep things civil and on topic in there or we'll have to boot you out of the webinar. We haven't had too much trouble with trolls, but we are ever vigilant, so watch out. We've got Liam on the patrol today. Um, if you do find the chat popping up uh, to be distracting, you should be able to click on it, which will let you move it and then hopefully move it to the side of the screen where it will be less distracting. And finally, this discussion is being recorded, uh, will be posted on our website and emailed to all of you after the discussion. So today, we are very pleased to host a discussion on the latest edition of Schwartz Media's Australian Foreign Affairs. It's Australia's leading journal in the field, and it makes foreign affairs accessible to a wide readership and encourages debate on the most significant global issues facing Australia. You can see Alan there. He's got his copy in his hot little hands uh, and another behind him. <laughs> so this issue is called the March of Autocracy, and in it, it examines the rise of authoritarian and illiberal leaders whose growing assertiveness is reshaping the Western-led world order. It explores the challenge for Australia as it enters a new era in which China's international sway increases and democracies compete with their rivals for global influence. Joining us today is Professor John Keane, Dr. Huang Lei Tu, and the Australia Institute's own Alan Bean. John King is a professor of politics at the University of Sydney and has a piece in this edition of Australian Foreign Affairs on the strategies of resilience within the growing Chinese empire and Western misconceptions of its rise. Professor King is the author of The New Despotism and is the author of When Trees Fall, Monkeys Scatter. He is also widely published on the subjects of democracy and authoritarianism. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor King. We're also joined by Dr. Huang Lei Tu, who is a senior policy, senior analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and has a piece in this issue of Australian Foreign Affairs on how Australia can improve its digital engagement and diplomacy within Southeast Asia. Prior to joining ASPE, Dr. Lei Tu taught at the Australian National University and worked across several think tanks throughout the Indo-Pacific. She is widely published and, I've been told, speaks five languages. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Lei Tu. And finally, Dr. Lei Tu and Professor Keane are joined on the panel today by Alan Beam, the Director of the International and Security Affairs Program here at the Australia Institute. Welcome, Alan. And I did just want to note that all participants are appearing in their personal capacity today, and we are thrilled to have them with us. Now, I wanted to start our conversation, if I may, by 
asking Professor Keane, in your essay, you say that China often confounds the usual terms used in political science textbooks. You talk about terms such as autocracy and tyranny and how they don't quite fit China uh, when you look at the literal definitions of those words. So how do you think we should define the Chinese polity in your view? Well, uh, Noah, uh, I'd like to uh, reply uh, as briefly as I can uh, on a note of disloyalty to uh, the, the whole theme of this webinar, uh, because uh, it seems to me that we're living through uh, an epochal historical shift uh, we could say it's from west to east. Um, it's of great historic, historical significance. And it's a period in which terms like autocracy, authoritarianism, totalitarianism come back. Um, they're not neutral terms. They have a history. But in this uh, context, I think they, um, uh, they're carriers of power. Um, they are part of a bull in a china shop mentality, we could say, um, part of an attempt really to pick a Cold War uh, against what is perceived to be uh, the main opponent uh, called the rise of China. Uh, you can see this um, uh, emerging Cold War mentality in talk of the need to repel um, Chinese naval strategies in the South China Sea, growing alarm about what will happen in uh, Taiwan. And I, I would say the very first press conference of, of uh, Joe Biden uh, is, is symptomatic of this um, crystallizing Cold War mentality when he spoke, as um, we all probably know, about the grand you know, struggle emerging between autocracy uh, and democracy, as if he'd read uh, Australian Foreign Affairs uh, issue number 11. I mean, I think um, uh, that, that point that these words are not neutral and that they are part of an attempt, I would say, to pick a fight uh, with China, um, have uh, some uh, other ingredients. Stereotyping China, I'll be very brief. Stereotyping China is part of this uh, Cold War mentality. China is said to be totalitarian. It's, um, it's run by gangsters. Um, they steal our jobs. Um, they engage in espionage through, you know, companies like uh, Huawei. They threaten our sovereignty and they likely are stirring up a Cold War. That's Clive Hamilton's view. Um, uh, and this, this, this will lead uh, to no good. Um, what is striking is that I think um, there's a failure uh, on this point. There's a failure to understand the complexities of China. And this um, is another quality of the Cold War thinking. I would call it, um, it could be called Falun Gongism. You know, that this is a, that China is a gangster regime. It's run by Marxist Leninists. There's, you know, the autocrat at the top of the system. Um, uh, th this, this kind of urge willfully to simplify uh, complexities is, is part of this Cold War mentality. And as you can tell, I don't particularly like this black and white thinking. Yan um, Lianka, who is uh, one of contemporary China's greatest novelists, says that simple-minded thinking about China is to be resisted because so many things go on inside China and China in the wider world that, are, that uh, you wouldn't dream of. And, and that, that rule you know, needs to be borne in mind when thinking uh, about China. So the, simple, uh, the simpleton thinking uh, that I think comes as part of this Cold War mentality turns, it's either silent about matters. For instance, no Australian media platform in the last 48 hours has reported the Greenland elections at the center of which is an Australian company, Greenland, which has Chinese um, capital that wants to mine rare earths in Greenland. It's, it's become the central issue. Silence. Mm. Um, this is a complication of the kind that I'm ob uh, objecting to. Um, the Cold War mentality doesn't see uh, the anomalies, the, the paradoxes, the ironies. 
we are members with China of the AIIB, this um, important uh, global bank. We are part, we've signatories to the um, uh, uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. Um, I could go on. And, and then finally, I would say that this uh, Cold War mentality of which the words um, autocracy and authoritarianism and totalitarians are part, this, this Cold War mentality is rather blind to the consequences of a Cold War, which in my view, um, or those strategic um, matters ought to be part of, of um, a rethinking of how our relationship should be with China. For instance, um, I don't think uh, that uh, any great global problem is to be solved in these early years of the 21st century without the cooperation and negotiation, sometimes tough negotiations with China. That's true on matters of climate change. It's true uh, in uh, matters of, um, uh, uh, let's say, small arms trade, um, uh, military buildup, and so on. And not only that, but um, imagine, as some cold warriors do, who call for the collapse or the destruction of China, Mike Pompeo, uh, towards the end of his term, you know, call for the people of China to rise up against the regime. What would be the consequences of that economically, politically, geopolitically? Well, there's very little consideration given to that. And so I, uh, in this essay, um, against this Cold War thinking, try to uh, point out that we need to think in more complex ways about China. We need to pay attention to the anomalies. We shouldn't stereotype um, and we should pay attention to the consequences of um, economic geopolitical picking a fight uh, with China. And- Mr. Keen, I might ask you in there, you, you, you've talked a little bit about- One, one last thing, I, I, it, it is, the upshot is, you know, uh, it, it's a version of Kevin Rudd's recent call for um, uh, what he uh, what he called um, managed strategic competition. I call it agile uh, realignment or non-alignment, agile non-alignment. I mean, being like a cat rather than a lion is what I think Australian foreign policy makers uh, should do. And I would say flag waving, it's, mm. uh, it's an old adage, you know, people who wave flags don't deserve to do so. That I think is the bottom line yeah. of my uh, whole approach to thinking about uh, or rethinking our relationship mm. with China. Mm. And there was a few terms that you touched on there uh, from your essay that I was hoping we might be able to unpack. Agile yeah. non-alignment, I'm hoping to ask about in just a bit, but there was the term phantom democracy that you use in your essay, talking about the complexity of the political, structural and organizational system uh, and how difficult it is to find. You have some interesting terms. Uh, phantom democracy is one and galaxy empire is another that you use in the essay. Could we unpack what you mean a little bit when you use these terms, perhaps starting with phantom democracy and the organizational structure of, uh, of the polity in China? Yes, gladly. Um, these are mouthfuls at um, 11, uh, 11, 14 in the morning. Uh, but on phantom democracy, the idea is that if you call China authoritarian or totalitarian or autocratic, you miss the point that this very complex polity, which is becoming a global polity, I think an empire, you miss the point that those who govern at all levels, right to the top, are skittish. They worry about the loss of popular loyalty. And therefore, in various um, strange ways that are not very well researched or widely understood, journalists tend not uh, to pay attention to them. Therefore, those who govern experiment with what they call democratic, mutual um, uh, mechanisms. You know, uh, the party at all levels in China uh, depends upon public opinion polling and, and methodologically uh, that public opinion polling is pretty accurate. Um, there are local elections, um, there are public forums, there is a certain toleration of uh, digital mutinies, as I call them, online. Um, and if you look at the Anchorage meeting, 
one of the things that the Chinese delegation said to the American delegation is, you know, you, you've been lecturing us for a couple of hundred years about democracy. Well, we have our own version. Um, that is not entirely um, false. Um, there is a semblance of um, democratic accountability in that the party worries that it, if that that uh, when trees fall, monkeys scatter. If if they lose their power, millions of lives will be damaged, and the whole system would would collapse. So the idea of a phantom democracy, rather like phantom limb or phantom pregnancy, is it's not um, it's not false. It's not just you know a mere illusion. It's true and it's not true. I mean, the great weakness of the Chinese polity, I tried to say in this essay, is the shortage of accountability democracy. You know, it's the shortage of open, um, open uh, disputes about power and the abuse of power. It's its great weakness. And yet it's a system, it must be understood, it's a system that um, uh, pays homage to democracy and practices democracy in such mechanisms as local people's courts mm. for resolving property disputes and marital uh, disputes and, and custody of children. These are, you know, the system is not to be understood as a kind of um, Nazi or Soviet Union uh, model of power. It's more complicated, cleverer than that. Mm. That's what I try to talk about in the New Despotism book at some length. Mm. Great. Well, thank you for that summation. Uh, time is flying. So I was hoping to ask Dr. Lei Tu, in your essay, you argue that Australia should be engaging with our Southeast Asian neighbours with a specific view to building up their digital capacity. Uh, and, and, you want, and you think that should be undertaken through a, a whole of government approach, sort of akin to the Pacific step up. Why is such an approach so important in your view? And what would it comprise of uh, in practical terms? Thank you, Noah. Yes, uh, the discussion of my essay is based on what actually Professor John King left off on. We have a world of competing great power com powers and Australia is an active actor um, and Southeast Asia as well, but Southeast Asia is our next door neighbor. We can't look away. Uh, Australia has inserted, started to, to um, kind of reinsert its, its influence and position in the, the South Pacific with the Pacific step up. And there's a debate whether it should attempt to do similar um, thing in Southeast Asia. But Southeast Asia is so much more bigger. It's, it's over 670 million people with very diverse political and economic landscape with very strong agencies as well. Um, yet, you know, it's, it's well recognized, uh, you know, in the US or China or elsewhere that Southeast Asia will remain the epicenter of great power competition. Now, what can Australia do about, you know, the influences that some of them that um, John just detailed uh, earlier on. Late last year, um, Mr. Maurice Payne said that Australia intends to compete constructively in the region, right? It wants to have agency that has a say in this great power competition. But, um, you know, dollar to dollar competition is not the way to go. We don't simply don't have that capacity. Uh, Australia's development aid uh, programs and funding had been on the decline lately. So I was thinking, what can we do? You know, where is our, str our strength? And in the appearing um, very, you know, fast moving and uh, fast developing arena is the digital arena. Australia has an upper hand, Australia's um, digital capacity, uh, digital readiness and digital um, you know, maturity is ranked globally very high. The government is committed to the agenda. It is actively um, promoting uh, the, the cyber norms within the UN uh, cyber norms and has actively up, taken upon that uh, task. Australia has the cyber ambassador, not every country had that. Um, there are many ways that Australia's digital capacity is really, you know, a world leading. Mm -hmm. Now, Southeast Asia is also very dynamic in that sphere. We have countries like Singapore who are on par with what Australia can do. And actually, Australia and Singapore do have digital um, uh, 
uh, commerce uh, agendas uh, of cooperation. But we also have countries whose digital um, maturities is lagging behind, such as Laos or Myanmar, and are likely to further um, lag behind after this pandemic. So uh, it is possible that the digital gap within Southeast Asia will continue to grow after the pandemic. Mm. So I think this is a really, you know, very important area where Australia can contribute. And we should not think about just engaging with the region in terms of, of um, aid and assistance. It's actually a region where the digital space particularly will grow. It's a very young nation, uh, a very young region in terms of population. So the innovation potential is great. In the next uh, decade or two or two, it can easily surpass, some of them can easily surpass Australia's capacity mm. too. And not yeah. only in terms of GDP, but also digital performance and digital innovation uh, capacity. So it's it's a long-term investment. I am arguing that by engaging in digital ag agenda, and we can go about it in very different ways, depending on which country we are talking yeah. about, um, and have tailored strategies to those countries, we are investing in our future, in our you know, in, in embedded future in next uh, decade or two, where the digital um, epicenter will be in the Southeast Asian region. Yes, for sure. Uh, thank you for that. I did just want to say, I see that we've had uh, a little over 500 people join us so far in the audience. Hello to everybody who's joined us and thank you for being with us. There'll be an opportunity in the second half of the webinar for us to take questions from the audience. So please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to them in a little while. But Dr. Leitu, I wanted to ask, um, in engaging more deeply with Southeast Asia in a digital capacity way, what are the risks that would be associated with that? And would we be seen to be uh, attempting to counter China's influence in the region? And what would that result in a, a sort of two uh, step technology approach into the region or separated technology or a separated internet? Or are we able to work cohesively in the region while building up our capacity? Well, the broader context, the discussion of gification of, of uh, technology is already happening. Um, and I think we, we saw it quite, uh, you know, uh, apparently during the 5G and Huawei debate. Australia's Huawei debate was very different from the debate in the region. And when I did my research, I wrote a report on different responses in Southeast Asia to Huawei and Huawei ban uh, from US, I, uh, one thing that I discovered is that the views are very different across the region and the views on um, cyber safety and security issues. And those were the main arguments that dominated Australia's debate on whether to use Huawei or not, security, right? But that cyber awareness and security awareness across the region was very different. And before we start, you know, asking partners and allies about the choice, which one do you prefer, uh, whether Huawei or, no, or other alternative and talk about the norms uh, of safety and uh, whatnot. It is very important to really understand the, the variety of cyber awareness in the region and what Australia has been already doing in many ways, whether it's uh, through a promotion of UN cyber norms or even engagement through like CSIRO that ha has presence in some of the Southeast Asian countries is really to build up that public um, awareness uh, across the region and as I said there's a huge gap that needs to be bridged before we get to um, uh, the discussion about Huawei and choices. Mm. So in a way um, the suggestion the proposals that I am uh, uh, putting in this essay is not just simply geopolitics is actually very utilitarian but also very pragmatic and very useful this is something that southeast asian countries would benefit from um, immediately and in long term australia as well mm -hmm. so uh, you know that by engaging early or well, it's not early uh, anyway southeast asia is actually already very 
uh, a competitive region, but uh, like I said, Australia has an upper hand in those um, uh, areas. Australia can um, engage constructively by uh, you know building up the capacity, bridging the digital gap, and you know investing in a more equal um, or you know a more equalized um, region rather than letting uh, those division deepen and uh, also could be exploited by the um, geopolitics and grid power competition. Yes, that's great. Thank you, uh, Alan. If I could come to you now, I, I feel like in these conversations, it's very useful to define key terms and to talk about the importance of, of language. We're, we're using language to talk about these hugely important concepts. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little specifically about uh, the concept of security uh, in terms of national and international security. I feel as a lay person, often the concept of security boils down to uh, conflict, uh, weaponry, and armed forces, but it's not as simple as all that, is it? Well, it's not, of course, and it's one of the reasons that I think uh, uh, Professor Keane's contribution is very important, that we need to deconstruct language all the time because uh, the way in which we use it brings with it the baggage of previous use. And uh, so we have to decontextualize language very often so that we're clear in what we're talking about. And then instead of making things muddy by sticking words like strategic or democratic or autocratic or tyrannical in front of uh, a, a country's name, we look at the country as it is uh, and, and are very careful that we don't misdiagnose what is going on in any given country. And I include the United States in this, by the way. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what's going on in the United States right now, simply because language is clouding our capacity to analyze clearly. So that's why I, I was thinking I might riff off uh, Professor Keane's essay a bit and, and go on a bit about language, but I'm pretty much aware of the time. And I notice in the chat room, there's been a fair bit of discussion about language. So I'm going to just skip through that, I think, uh, and just make a couple of very short remarks about the rest of the volume, mm. just in case uh, the participants this morning haven't read all of the essays. Um, they are all really worth reading. They were quite different in the take that they have on China and on the sorts of problems that we're dealing with around autocracy and democracy. But certainly the essay by Natasha Kasim and Darren Lim is a, a helicopter essay. It takes a very high level view of the issue and offers rather high level commentary on the sorts of things that we might be able to do uh, in current circumstances. Um, I think what is uh, really uh, interesting about, about their essay is that they see absolutism, sorry, autocracy as the system where the prerogatives of the state uh, are put above the rights of the individual. And that's actually quite an interesting way of looking at what autocracy is. Um, it's not the only way, but it is, is I think, helpful. And for any of the denizens of the bubble, um, I note that uh, Jonathan Perlman, who's the editor of, of uh, Australian Foreign Affairs, and Natasha Kassam will be actually talking on this uh, next week in Canberra at Muse. So I won't go any further into their essay. They can do that themselves. Mm. I was really taken by Linda Javen's uh, uh, really quite a remarkable essay, I think. Um, she, as I think many of the people participating this morning would know, is a, is a really eminent uh, Sinologist and Chinese language expert. And um, although her essay begins with a few niggles about China, she moves quite quickly into a set of very constructive uh, recommendations about what it is we really all need to do. And at the heart of her essay, I think, is that what we really need to do is to understand China. And um, as I was reading her essay, I was thinking, well, isn't it interesting that since at least the time of Deng Xiaoping, uh, China has invested enormous uh, energy into accessing English and European languages. Um, there's a very high level of linguistic expertise in China these days, particularly amongst their diplomats. Uh, and they've done it not because they particularly love or admire um, the Anglosphere or Europe. It's because they need to understand it. 
And um, I think we've got exactly the same problem, uh, most particularly in Australia, where our levels of expertise on matters uh, relating to China, whether it's Chinese language or using language to access an understanding of Chinese culture, Chinese politics, how the economy actually works. Um, we are well behind the queue line here. And um, I, I think that a lot more effort needs to be put into that. And I think Linda's essay pushes very hard for that. And the final of the essays this week, uh, uh, this month is um, Sam Rogovine's very interesting contribution um, uh, it's a very sobering contribution because he grounds the whole of his approach in the reality of the world in which we currently live. Uh, and that is a world in which relatively the power and the influence and the credibility of the United States has begun to decline. And so if that's the starting point, uh, what Sam is really talking about, uh, and I might by way of declaration of interest here. Sam and I have been sparring partners on matters like this for 20 years, and um, I always read carefully what he's got to say. Um, he, he offers a really, I think, optimistic caution. And that is that uh, the United States and China, notwithstanding all the pressures that so-called experts put on them to enter into some kind of cold war, he offers the view that actually going to war is simply not an option because for both of them, the task is too big and the stakes uh, are, are too small. In other words, what they'd get out of it is not proportionate to what they'd have to put into it. So he really uh, recommends the defense of democratic values rather than simply trying to impose them on everybody else. Uh, and, and to that extent, I think, uh, has offered uh, a set of quite realistic and, and uh, usable recommendations that would allow us to get into the business of an engagement with China, which is not about appeasing power, but simply accommodating power shifts. And that, I think, is the theme that sits underneath all of the essays uh, that uh, are in the current volume. And I will just end with a, a remark about the fix, because that's Dr. Letu's particular contribution. And um, that is an innovation of Jonathan Perlman's, which I think is very welcome, that we can have all of this abstract stuff and we can all talk about it and get an enormous thrill out of doing so. But at the end of the day, people say to us, well, what are you gonna do about it? And uh, I think what Dr. Letu has offered is a concrete example of what a country like Australia can do to leverage the skill sets that it's already got available to it, both in its broad uh, community, that's the skill sets that come out of our universities, essentially, uh, and uh, across our economy. Um, I think the only comment that I would make, and I would strongly suspect that Dr. Latou is going to agree with this, is that $34 million is a drop in the bucket. And that if we're going to take that kind of task seriously, uh, as perhaps taking the broader task of a deeper engagement with the Pacific and with Asia, then we've got to put our money where our mouth is and radically increase uh, the investment we make in the long-term economic and strategic security of the world in which we immediately live. And I think that would be a pretty smart investment. And, and I might just leave that question mark hanging because Dr. Latou might want to respond to that straight off because it is the fix. Yes, Dr. Lee too. did you want to add to Alan's comments there? Yes, absolutely. Like I said in the essay, uh, the, the 34 million that you mentioned, Alan, but also other initiatives um, are the drop in our ocean and um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Actually, some of them have already been in place. What I'm arguing is, you know, double down or triple down on those yes. good initiatives, make it um, a whole of government. And uh, as you said, multiply the really investment and amounts to really make a difference. Because for the Pacific Step Up, for example, we, we're talking about billions. And for Southeast Asia, which is so much more bigger, we're still talking about millions, which is really not going to make much of difference. But those are exactly the areas where Australia can make a difference. So, and, and also perhaps uh, you know the government can't do it alone. It can. It has to bring along with it companies and private sectors yes. who yes. are will largely profit from this very vibrant and innovative uh, market. So uh, here it is. It is an uh, you know. A, public partner, uh, private partnership opportunity. Mm, that's great, thank you. 
Um, I might uh, switch now to questions from the audience. Looking in the Q&A section, there's a, a range of questions there. Um, Professor Keane, I might go to you first with this question, but if our other panelists uh, want to engage as well, please uh, do so after we hear from Professor Keane. Uh, Alan Sharples asks, what do we know about China's goals regarding its relationship with the West? Um, a, a question there about goals and, and the future uh, for China. Well, I'm working on a book with a Chinese colleague, which um, comes out of the foreign affairs essay, uh, which makes the case for thinking that China is not um, well, not um, properly understood as a as a territorial state, but actually is an empire. It's not, um, and it's an empire of a kind that we've never seen before. Uh, and it has a kaleidoscopic quality. And so there are many things going on in relation to the West um, that are difficult to comprehend at first glance. For instance, uh, yes, Xinjiang. Um, yes. Hong Kong and Tibet, you know, the, the, like all empires, um, there are crackdowns and, um, and people disappear and people are put into camps, yes. But um, it's an empire in which it may not be known to uh, those present uh, this morning. It's, a, it's an empire in which after seven years, a major deal was um, signed uh, with the European Union. Um, uh, a comprehensive agreement um, about trade, investment, um, respect for uh, values, rule of law, in which um, the Chinese agreed to honor um, free trade unions of European companies operating in China and respect um, uh, trade unions within the European Union. So this is um, the story of, uh, it's a very complicated story, and I think one other thing that's worth uh, mentioning in this question of the, the West and China is that uh, we saw four years of an American empire probably uh, accelerating in decline, uh, where there was an attempt to shift to bilateralism, to break up institutions, you know, don't agree uh, to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, paralyze the WTO, uh, et cetera. Um, what's striking is the commitment of China, as I think several um, questions and comments have already said, is the commitment of China to the continuation of multilateral institutions. And during the last 30 years, according to my calculations, uh, around about 25 new cross-border institutions have actually been built by the Chinese. They have gained from globalization. They are committed to uh, cross-border um, uh, nonviolent um, negotiations and deals. And that's something that we can take advantage of as we did uh, when we joined the AIIB, as we did when we joined the RCEP, and um, as we did in patching up the um, dispute uh, court in the WTO. It, 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 we, not many people may know, but effectively under Trump, the WTO was paralyzed because um, the United States decided to simply shut down the appellate court. Um, a parallel court has appeared, a substitute court, with the backing of Australia and Canada and China and other uh, states. So, you know, that's an example where um, uh, the relationship of China and the West is extremely complicated, but in which there are opportunities. And if you think of it as an empire rather than as kind of Nazi, you know, state, or a Soviet Union that you know wants to crack heads and colonize and you know blah blah blah, uh, then you miss, I think, the the nuances and you miss the strategic opportunities uh, that we can gain. This applies, of course, to fields like education, tourism, which are suffering at the moment um, because of this emerging Cold War, you know, ball in the China shop. Uh, 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 thing. Right. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Did either of our panelists want to add any comments on that? No? Great. There was uh, another question here, um, and I'll ask this one of Dr. Lei Tu. Um, 
Anonymous question asks, is Elon Musk's satellite internet network going to help close the cyber gap in Southeast Asia? I think we could talk you know, more generally about major leaps in technology that may be coming. And uh, you mentioned in your essay as well that the pandemic itself is accelerating um, digital growth. I don't think we would all be sitting here uh, on Zoom with 500 of our Australian friends if it weren't for the pandemic encouraging us all into the digital space. Are there major leaps in technology coming that will help bridge this digital divide in Southeast Asia? I, I think it won't be one thing that will help bridge the divide. It is a continuous effort. And as, as you say, some would leap forward, um, the speed of development won't be equal. So uh, the gap and lagging behind would, would be a phenomenon that would persist, but uh, that would need constant effort to, to counter. Like I said in the East essay, for example, um, the pandemic uh, also en enabled some to move digitalization faster, but not all of them have been equipped to do that and trans transition so fast and so smoothly. And even with education, um, if the school started online teaching, not all schools had computers, not all families had computers or internet. So we might have, you know, a group in individual countries and societies where are left behind because of lack of that capa simple capacity. But at the same time, many countries in Southeast Asia um, and Vietnam, of course, being one of them, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, other examples that really lead in this digital transformation. And a study that done by the Asian Development Bank was very interesting to, to show the bigger picture um, the statistics that Southeast Asia is actually leading in many aspects um, ahead of the global, uh, um, global uh, average in this digital uh, transformation. And some of them have their own uh, national strategies in place. Like for example, Vietnam has its 4G a fourth industrial uh, revolution strategy in place, which is uh, pursuing quite uh, actively and even aggressively. And Southeast Asia has also its master plan of digital connectivity that it wants to achieve by 2025 in, in of course, some aspect. So it is very uneven uh, development and depending what we are talking about, um, some of, uh, you know, for example, Vietnam will and um, Singapore and some other countries would want to pursue uh, artificial intelligence in, in its future labor forces um, and a future of jobs, for example. But there are, will be other things that will be lacking. For example, the security norms and um, standards are not equal, equal either, even though uh, those countries are looking for um, mutual cooperation. So there's a lot of you know, it's, it's a moving target. It is a huge uh, um, domain that is evolving as we speak. And really it, it waits for no one. So um, Australia, it, it really wants to play an uh, a meaningful role and have an impact and, uh, you know, um, uh, influence positively. It mm. should really um, start doing it sooner than later. Mm. That's great, thank you. Uh, next question, I might ask you, Alan. John Neve asks, how important is helping China in a non-condescending way? Um, there's a lot in that question, I think, and it, one would need to unpack it. Um, I'm not certain myself the extent to which we're in a position to help China on very much. And uh, maybe the very fact that we think we can help China is the most condescending thing that we can do. Um, I think the way in which we all need to deal with each other, whether it's a massive country like China, which is an economy 10 times the size of Australia's, um, or whether it's a country like Australia, which has got a population of 25 million, uh, which is nothing like the 1.5 billion that China has, is, is to realise exactly who you are, um, where you stand. Uh, and so, issues around any form of condescension are simply not playable uh, in that kind of appropriate uh, conversation that has to be conducted between countries which are different, very often disparate, and most often not, not equal. 
Um, there have been a number of questions running through the, the, the chat column there, uh, which in a way touch upon this question, and some of them are around human rights. And I thought I might just touch on the human rights uh, question, given that we've only got 15 minutes to run, because there is a quite a stream of it. And, and I think that there are a couple of things that we can do about human rights, which are not obvious. Uh, the first one is make sure that our own house is in order. Um, the, the UN has made a couple of, of quite seriously critical reports about Australian approaches to human rights here, most particularly with respect to refugees. But if one looks more deeply into human rights as it operates or as they operate uh, in Indigenous Australia, one can see that there are a lot of things in which Australia is still falling short. So the first thing to do, it's a bit of the, the glass houses syndrome, I suppose. If you're going to live in one, please don't throw stones. Now that's not to say for a moment that you don't talk about human rights. The question that you do talk about is, and, and you reflect on your own experience of human rights, is that generally speaking, uh, an accepting and positive approach to difference, uh, an accepting and positive approach to inclusion, offers a sounder social fabric than does any movement which seeks to mash down difference and to turn everybody into a kind of homogenized replica of everybody else. Now, we have a bit of that conversation going on in Australia at the moment around identity, for example, um, where identity is often imposed on people as a kind of way of being the same. Whereas what we really want in Australia, I think, is an identity which is about diversity and that we're stronger in diversity than we are by simply being all the same. And so when one talks about human rights in the broad, such as the Uyghurs problem in Western China, or in the more narrow sense, the, the, the rights of protesters in Hong Kong, or the rights of people to vote in Taiwan, then you have to talk about it in the positive terms that replicate your own experience, rather than uh, refer negatively and critically to what you imagine to be the experience of your interlocutor. It's a very difficult area to work in, but I do think that it is possible to have an engagement with China on human rights, as we did a decade ago, which is constructive in both ways, but which doesn't seek to point obloquy and, and criticism and shame to China, that is an act of condescension, but rather talks about it in a way which is to the benefit of the Uyghurs in the first place, but perhaps also to the credibility and the authority and the legitimacy of the government in Beijing at the same time. Thank you for those observations, Alan. Professor Keane, you wanted to add to that? Yes, I, I mean, very much um, uh, in support of what Alan has said, I think um, uh, cleaning up the Algian stables, you know, of Australian democracy um, is a priority. And I, I think that it, if, if we are to refuse block thinking, you know, black and white block thinking, China is, you know, the great threat to democracy, whereas we you know, should be proud of our democracy, it forgets. Um, we need a new deal for women in this country. Yes, yes. Have We have no uh, representative body for our indigenous peoples. Uh, we have several million permanent residents who do not have the right to vote. Uh, we do not have an anti-corruption commission at the federal level. I mean, it's these kinds of reforms and as Alan says, the protection of our multiculturalism and its strengthening. It's these kinds of reforms, democratic reforms, the democratization of our democracy, which I think would, would make us much more resilient and more able, that is less hypocritically, um, to um, make comments uh, about other polities in the world, including uh, China. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for that contribution. And it does, the, in the questions from the audience, there's a sort of a thread that's emerging that I wanted to ask you about, which touches on that. Um, and it's about how Australia engages with China and the United States in this new world. In your essay, you say that 
both reckless China bashing and moonstruck love affairs with America are dead ends. And earlier in the talk, you mentioned your uh, concept of agile non-alignment. Could you unpack that a little further and, and how that could work for Australia going forward? Well, um, I, I, I don't, I, I think um, putting me in charge of strategic policy would be a little bit like um, uh, allowing a goat to look after the garden. Uh, but what I do think is that um, in this great historical moment that we're living through, where I think the evidence is accumulating that there is something of a shift from west to east, uh, it's a very complicated shift, but we're caught up in it. And um, we are, whether we like it or not, um, part of this broader region. Um, uh, I do think, as I said at the outset, and I think in a way there's quite a lot of agreement that, that block thinking, that Cold War mentality is strategically unhelpful um, and, um, and would lead actually to very undesirable consequences for us as for um, the wider region. And therefore, um, the trick um, in sectors such as education and tourism and, and, um, uh, and new uh, information technologies, robotics, etc. cetera, the, the trick is to find ways of protecting our interests um, without compromising our values and, um, and negotiating deals. I do think that um, uh, waking up to the decline of the United States, uh, the evidence is mounting. Waking up to that dynamic is very important. The old arguments don't work. Militarily, of course, the United States um, outguns um, the next seven or eight major powers, including China. But if the argument is that our values are the same as the United States, it's not true. Uh, we don't do guns. Uh, we don't have a murder rate of um, that. We do not have a gap between rich and poor, et cetera, et cetera, and we're not an empire. So, you know, the talk that we should naturally be aligned with the United States seems to me to be uh, wearing thin. And strategic non-alignment, um, managed strategic competition, as Kevin Rudd recently said, um, is a clear alternative. And it's worth... Uh, for those uh, who are um, uh, in this webinar, it's worth um, recommending that Kevin Rudd piece published quite recently, I think, uh, in uh, Foreign Affairs, and he's done a version at the Lowy, where he says, uh, his final word is, may the best system win. I mean, you know, uh, I, 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 uh, that's, that's tongue in cheek, but it's to say that um, we need to prove our own resilience. We need to uh, strengthen our democracy. Um, our multiculturalism and so on. And that would make us stronger in the world, uh, economically and geopolitically, or so I think. Hence, no flag waving uh, for those who don't deserve a flag. Yes, thank you for that. Dr. Leitu, um, there is a question in the chat asking, will artificial intelligence displace many workers throughout Southeast Asia? And I think that might point to a, a broader question around are there fears or dangers or um, opposition that we would have to overcome if Australia were to step into the region and invest more heavily in digital engagement? Um, if I could continue John's um, point for a moment before I get to that point. Yes. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more that the whole narrative about um, alliances of democracies versus autocracies can be found dangerous. And Southeast Asia is really a good example to look at because if, um, and that's why, you know, Trump's foreign policy and Pompeo's rhetoric were very unpopular in Southeast Asia and in the region because that simply didn't, um, didn't resonate at all. And if you look at um, 
global indexes of democracy and democratic health is actually not doing very well globally, not only just Southeast Asia. And democracies or full democracies are actually you know, in minority. And um, including the US, it had a lot of uh, issues itself as well. And if you look specifically in Southeast Asia, we're talking about 10 ASEAN countries and one um, uh, Timor as a, a, the 11th one. And you know, depending which, um, which uh, indexes you look at, but in general, it's only Timor that is considered free. The rest is either partial free uh, or um, you know, hybrid regimes or one party regimes. So if you look just in Southeast Asia and if you want um, kind of solidarity based on democracies, you're not gonna go very much far uh, with, with that rhetoric. And what countries are interested in is development rather than you know, pure ideological solidarity. That's not gonna, that's not going to go far. It didn't really work out during Cold War. Um, it had a lot of issues there, and I think it, it won't even work um, nearly as close uh, this time around, if, if we want to call it. Um, a lot of people call it, um, you know, Cold War 2.0. Um, in in com, 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 coming back to your question about artificial intelligence, I think. Um, it's a question that uh, we are uh, still struggling with that even, even in, in so-called cyber mature countries such as Australia. I think some jobs will risk that, but I think in a, in a way you could look at it as a positive kick for Southeast Asian, um, the developing economies that we're looking at, uh, you know, growing in the value chain um, anyway. What it, it what is interesting though that China is also grappling with that you know it, it is a model in terms of developing economy in many ways and had leaped uh, so fast in embracing um, the digital agenda and uh, it's it's also you know pouring a lot of money into R and D and and wanting to transition in artificial intelligence so I don't think that alone would keep um, the innovation would keep or slow the progress of, of that phenomenon anyway. I think um, if anything, Southeast Asian populations, which are young and innovative and very, very tech savvy in many ways, in many cities, uh, would find um, a better way to coexist with it uh, than many developed countries, actually. Great, thank you. Uh, we only have about uh, one or two minutes left, so I might give the closing word to Alan. Um, and I wanted to ask you about uh, if we could zoom out the broader global context. We talk about the, the march of autocracy uh, and looking at the editor's note from Jonathan Pellman in this issue of Australian Foreign Affairs. Uh, he notes that for the first time since 2001, more autocratic, autocratic states in the world than democracies exist currently. Can you briefly, considering the uh, constraints on time we have, summarize where we're at in, in the global context and any concerns or hopes for the future uh, around Australia's place in that world? Look, I think one of, the, one of the problems we've had since really the end of the Second World War is that the winners uh, thought that it would be a good thing that the whole of the rest of the world adapted itself to the fundamental principles that united the winning side. Uh, and they largely were expressed through the UN Charter. They're, if you read the UN Charter, it's a very nice document. But one wonders, uh, here we are, you know, 75, 80 years later, uh, exactly whether that is the prescription uh, that we need to follow. Do we need to have a universal system or are we prepared in the broad global community to accept the kind of diversity that we actually love in our own society and, and that we see as one of the strengthening factors in the way in which our society works? I mean, it's fabulous that the whole of Australia doesn't look like me, for God's sake, and, and it is equally fabulous that we have the model of Indigenous Australia, which see themselves as belonging to the land for, what, 60, 65,000 years, uh, whereas we tend to think that the land belongs to us. And if we don't sort of break up that binary a bit and, and have an entirely different way of thinking about it, then we're going to bring binary analysis into the way in which we look at the world. 
And I think I might just complete with by, by coming back to Sam Rogovine's remark at the end of his essay, which is essentially that China feeds on liberalism. It doesn't want universal liberalism. In other words, there, have to be a plural, there has to be a plurality of systems that allows everybody to get on and to get on well. Uh, there will be tensions, but the more you accept difference and, and uh, so on, the better it will be for everybody in calming it down and negotiating our way forward. So let me just end there. Well, thank you, Alan, for those uh, summary comments. And it has brought us to the end of our time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And can you please join me in thanking our guests, Dr. Huang Lei Tu, Professor John Keane, and Alan Bean. I also wanted to thank everyone who joined us and for your great questions. As always, I'm sorry we weren't able to get through more of them, but we appreciate your attendance and your engagement in these conversations. I just wanted to mention that you can buy the issue of Australian foreign affairs that we have been discussing today and Alan is so capably holding up to camera right now. Uh, if you go to australianforeignaffairs.com, you can use the code AFA11TAI to get $3 off uh, and receive the copy for just $20. Please join us in the coming weeks for more exciting webinars. As I mentioned, you can sign up via our website, australiainstitute.org.au. Next Wednesday, April 14th at 11 a.m., we will be discussing the economics of climate and energy with Chris Bowen, the new Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy. I want to thank you all again. Thank you to our panelists for joining us today uh, and ask that we all look after each other out there and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks all and bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.